God is good and all the time are you thankful to be here this morning have you already felt God have you already experienced his goodness has he been faithful already this morning has he been good I want you to come back out tonight if you're local some of our Ohio friends are going to be taken back uh, off home uh, after the church service let's give them a hand for coming we love you guys we, we appreciate you Brother Nate, Sister Shannon, we got the remnant team, and then all, all the groupies, right? All the, the groupies for Jesus came along. And we're thankful you guys made it, four and a half, five hour drive all the way over here to be with us. You know, and then we got some people right here in town can't drive five minutes out to church. What, what's your priorities? What, what, what excuse you got? What, what excuse you got? That's not even in my notes, but what excuse do you have? that you're not going to be able to come out and worship like this with other believers. Amen. And so tonight, what I don't want to happen is I don't want you all to be so tired and wore out that you don't come. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home after this, and I want you to eat lunch. And then I want you to take your good old-fashioned Sunday afternoon nap. Get recharged, get revived, and come back out. Because Pastor Brandon's got a four-and-a-half-hour sermon for you all. He said, he told me, he said, I can out-preach Nate and Shannon any day. I got five or six hours ready. Now, it's a school night. We'll try to keep it a little shorter tonight so y'all can get home. But listen, I'm not going to hinder the Holy Spirit either. We're not going to hinder the Holy Spirit, but it's going to be dry. It'll be dry enough under that tent. The rain's going to stop by tonight. The Holy Spirit told me that we needed to move inside this morning, so that's why we're here. I think it was a good move. I, I love the air conditioning. Selfishly, I love the air conditioning, church. I'm thankful for the air. Thank you, Jesus. I've been five times in Jamaica, and we started a church there once, and oh my goodness, it was 120 degrees, and they just had this little hut and all these little seats, but the people were there worshiping Jesus. They didn't care. They were there all day long. I started getting hungry because I'd never been to one of their church services, and I thought, there's not an Arby's down the road here. What am I going to do? Now, I'm a big old boy. I like to eat. And I thought, goodness, I love spiritual food, but I need something physical. I'm famished. I wasn't planning on fasting today. I mean, just, <laughs> you know, it's hard for a big boy to fast. I mean, that's a real challenge. And so uh, I'll never forget, they said, hey, everybody hungry? We're like, yeah, we're starved. And they went out and slaughtered some chickens. And then, yeah, I know, listen, some of you pet lovers, just listen. It gets really good because then they got an old tire wheel out. And they started them a fire, and they coated that fried chicken in some kind of breading like I've never had before. And they fried it crispy. It came out bright orange. It was so flavored and seasoned. And boy, we ate and we ate and just praised God. Then we went right back into the church and had church until 10 o'clock that night. All day church and dinner on the grounds. Come on now. Are you willing to say, Lord, hear my sin me, and God, whatever it takes for me to draw closer to you, that's what I'm willing to do. Get out of our own way. Step aside. Quit being selfish. And so I, I want to start with something funny. I like to smile. I, I think God's people, like Shannon said last night, we shouldn't be grumpy. We shouldn't be grouchy as Christians. We should be happy. We should be blessed. We should be upbeat. And, and there was a community tent revival that had concluded, and three of the uh, area pastors were meeting and discussing with one another how things went, and the Methodist minister, God bless the Methodist, he said, praise God, the tent revival worked out great for us. We gained three, we gained four new people, he said. I think four new people. And they're like, that's great. The Southern Baptist preacher said, oh, it gets better. He said, praise God, we gained six new people and boy they were praising the lord and then then the non-denominational pastor said with tears in his eyes well we had the greatest blessing of them all brother he said we got rid of 10 of our biggest troublemakers <laughs> i want to begin with the verse in psalm chapter 85 and i, I know that the theme verse for this uh, revival as we prepared for it was Psalm chapter 80, but let's read on down this morning. How many of you know that there's a verse and then there's something called context? We learned that in school, right? And, and you need to make sure that when you're reading a verse, you're reading the context around it. You can't just cherry pick out a, a verse and stand on a doctrine just based on that one verse. You've got to take the whole Bible into fact whenever you figure out what the truth is. And so Psalm chapter 85 verse 4 says, Now restore us. Revive us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. 
Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? And I want you to hear this verse here in 6. Won't you revive us again? So your people can rejoice in you. How many of you are revived this morning? Let's pray. Father God, we pray you'd show up and show off. And God, we just pray that we would just stay bold in this sermon, God, and that the hearts would be prepared to receive the message that we're about to give. And God, we want you to take us out of ourselves. It's not about Brad Brown. It's about God this morning and what the Holy Spirit wants to do through me. And God, we just pray you'd move. We pray you would touch our lives. You would soften our hearts for the word today. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, loudly the church says. There was an old man driving down the road in his old Ford pickup truck. Thank God for old Ford pickup trucks. And the gentleman, some of you Chevy fans, thank God for Ford pickup trucks. And this gentleman and his wife had been married for 50 years, which is a big accomplishment in today's world. And his wife was sitting clear over. It was one of those trucks. Remember those old trucks that the bench went all the way across the front? And if they weren't buckled in, boy, they'd just slide right over and hit you. And it was. It was one of those trucks, a big old seat, and his wife was clear over, pressed against the window, as close as she could get. And here he's over here just driving that old boy. And he looks over, and he sees that his lovely bride of 50 years is upset. She's visibly shaken. She's just looking mad. And she turned to her husband. Finally, he had been, been silent the whole ride. Finally, she turned over and said, Honey, we sure don't sit close to each other in this truck like we used to when we were dating. Remember those days? And they begin to reminisce on that. And she said, I, I don't know why, why I don't sit in the middle anymore. I don't know why we don't. We're just not that close anymore. The old man with wisdom and age in his eyes turned and looked at his lovely bride and said, Betty, when we were first married, I was sitting holding this same steering wheel. And he said, today, I'm still holding this same steering wheel. He said, if anybody moved, it's not me, it's you. If anybody got further away in our relationship, it's not me. It's you. Can I tell you what? That God's driving the truck of life down this road. He's steering our truck. He's steering our car. He's the captain of our ship. And we're clear pressed over against the window. Some of you all are hanging out the window. In fact, there's some of you believers that are running behind the truck trying to keep up with the truck. And what God is saying, you've moved. He did not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Betty, you just slide on over this seat and get a little closer to me. Can I tell you what? Some of y'all need to slide over the seat of life and get next to your captain. Get next to your driver. I see these bumper stickers. They're not as common anymore, but it says, God is my co-pilot. Can I tell you what? That's false. God is my pilot. He's my pilot. I mean, he's not my co-pilot. He's driving my life. He's the pilot today. And I, I want you to know... That revival is not this big mystical thing. That it's a simple message today, church. It's not this big mystical thing that only happened in our history books. Can I tell you what? Revival is not just a thing of the past. Revival is here and revival is now. It starts now. We're in a season of revival this past few nights I tell you what the altars have been flooded we've seen healings we've seen salvations rededications we've seen demons cast out of people we've seen all kinds of things happen out there under that tent revival is here and revival is now and I don't want to touch on it too much because that's Pastor Brandon's calling tonight but I tell you what I don't want to see revival stop after tonight I don't want to see this energy just be sucked out of our church I want it to grow. I want it to continue. My Bible says, I quoted that, but I'll give you the verse. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Our God is the same today as he was in the great awakenings of our past. Our God is the same God today that he was years ago when revival would break out and hundreds and thousands of people would come to him. Our God is the same as he was in those old camp meetings where people would just flood the place and there'd be so many people sitting there that they'd have to get a lawn chair out in the yard. I've heard of church services where they had to open the windows so people outside could hear them. I tell you what, we serve the same God that can still do that today. Our God is not just a God of power in the past. He's a God of power right now in your life and in your walk. He can make you live victoriously free from sin. I believe that with all my heart. That doesn't mean pure perfection because only Jesus is that. But every day, are you being sanctified and waking up and saying, I want to look more like Jesus today. I want to talk more like Jesus. I want to act. I want to be. I want to care more like Jesus. May I remind you this morning that God is the same God today as he was in the Bible. I love Brandon's heart. He's constantly pointing you to that. That, hey, you're in the Scripture. You're a part of the Bible. It's a living, breathing element of our faith. It's not just reading about Moses and Jacob and I. It's not just reading about all those great men and women, their testimony. It it lines up with a lot of our lives and our story. You're writing your story right now. What's your testimony? How you spending your time? How you spending your life? Are you living it for the things of God or the things of the world and culture and the enemy? I tell you what, I'm so thankful that our God is enduringly strong. Our God is entirely sincere. He's eternally graceful. He's impurely perfect. He's impartially merciful. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. And today I want you to know that our God is a holy God. And the Bible says because he's holy, we can be holy. Amen. Come on. Our God's not diminished in power in 2022. Quit believing the lie that Satan's feeding to you. Oh, he tells you all kinds of things. Well, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You haven't been saved long enough. You don't know all the scriptures. You didn't even know half the worship songs. I don't care. All you need to know is Jesus today. And he alone. And he will help you grow. He'll help you further your walk. He's not diminished in strength. He still has ability today to save you and to keep you. Our God is still the same is what I'm trying to say today. I know it's a simple thought, but some of us need to be reminded of it. Our God is the same today as he was when you first gave your life to him. Remember that burning passion that fell down into your life, that zeal that you had when you first got saved? Don't forget that. Keep tapping into that power. If there's a lack of power in the church today, listen, I hear it all the time. There's there's not power in the church, Pastor Brad. I remember when God used to do this. I read the Bible, I see what God was doing. It's just not here anymore. If there's a lack of power in our churches today, it's our fault. We're the ones that moved. If you're seeking power and not finding power, I'd question, are you praying? Because I tell you what, prayer brings about power. And if you ain't praying, you'll never have power. Come on, church. Can we dig a little bit this morning? I believe that our God wants to do something new and fresh and powerful in this day and hour. This is a season of revival. It's been birthing up for a long time. I remember uh, years ago, God gave me a vision of a mighty rushing river. Remember that? I remember Linda back there, Mama Linda we call her. She said, I was going down to Pigeon Fords, Tennessee to see a brother down there. And she said, hey, there's something about this word river. And when somebody gives you a word, you've got to pray for confirmation. You don't just take it at face value. You say, well, I'll pray on that, and I'll seek God. He'll confirm it in my heart. And honestly, I thought it was crazy. I did. I went down the river. I'm going to the mountains. And I went down there, and I'll tell you what. I, I turned on to the road where the guy lived, and I hadn't even really paid attention to it. And I, I, I turned on it. It was River Circle Drive. Where is that word river? 
And you know I heard the word river three or four different times that week from different people. I remember I went into a music shop where I'd bought my first Martin guitar, and it was there in Powell, Tennessee, and I walked into that music shop, and there was this older guy that walked in just in tennis shoes and regular clothes, and he sat down, he started playing some gospel songs, and I joined him, and I got talking with him, and he said, I've been a pastor for over 45 years. And he said, uh, you're a new pastor. He started to pour into me. And he said, and, and this was just out of nowhere. He said, you know what? He said, brother, there's a mighty river. Amen. What'd you say again? I, I got, got it on video, some of it. He said, there's a mighty river getting ready to rush in your heart and through your, the church that God has helped you to start. And he said, that river is going to purge away dross. That river is going to purge away sin. That river is going to just flow and rush through the people. And it'll be undeniable the presence of God is going to fall upon your ministry. Can I tell you what? I came back and there, it didn't seem like that river started flowing. And I got discouraged. And for years I've been praying, Lord, send the river. Can I tell you what? This weekend I felt that river break free. I felt the dam loosen. And that river is flowing. Because some of y'all been swampy. And if you're in the swamp, there's a bunch of stinky stuff and alligators and spiders and snakes. And you're living in that swamp and it stinks. It's nasty. Let the river flow and get rid of all that stagnation. I'm tired of stagnation in our nation. Amen. Let's let the river of God flow. We're the ones that moved. He's wanting to do something in this hour and in this season here in this community. And I'm going to warn you, church, you better hang on tight. You better buckle up. You better get ready for what God is going to do. I believe it's still possible for the people of God to seek the face of God and turn from their wicked ways and live that victorious lifestyle. And when that happens, you will start to see a supernatural move of God that will birth up in this generation like we've never seen before. And I believe that even things that's happened this weekend, they're going to change things in your family for generations to come. I believe this weekend that some generational curses have been freed and loosened and broke in some people's lives. And because mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa got it, guess what? Generations to come are going to be changed because of your choice and your faith and your decision this weekend. This weekend, praise God. I want God to do something here in Coles County and all the surrounding counties like we've never seen before. And I want to be able to say, this isn't us. This isn't one man. This isn't one lady. This isn't a group of people. This is something we can't take credit for. This is God. What you've seen this weekend is not Nate and Shannon and Remnant and all the worshipers. It's not. They're just vessels being used by God. What you experienced this weekend, even if you got your toes stepped on, what you experienced this weekend was the Holy Spirit. And we make it all about Jesus here at Family Worship Center. We make him the main attraction. I tell you, I want our children, I want my children to be raised in a church where they don't have to read history books to be reminded of who God is. I, I, I'm a daddy of a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old. And I want them to see things in God like they have never seen before, that they don't have to get older and say, why didn't that happen in our life? Why, why is that only in the history books? I want them to experience and see it with their very own eyes. And we're making history this weekend with our inaugural tent meeting. Do you all want to see us do it again? Yeah. You got the white flag going back there, Shannon. Somebody brought it in. Anybody else got your white flag? I kind of like that. It lets me know you're agreeing with me a little bit, right? Because some of y'all just sit there so pious and holy staring at me like we're at a funeral. It makes me nervous. <laughs> I like you to be a little loosened up. Don't give me those looks. I see some of those looks. Quit giving them to me. I don't like it. But I tell you what, the history books will record what happened this weekend. 
We're, we're going to archive it because someday in these pictures that, uh, where's Courtney Burkheimer? Is she out there? Hey, aren't those wonderful pictures she's been taking? And here's the deal, 40, 50 years from now, I want those pictures. I want to be able to look back on what God did this week and be reminded. Have you seen all those old history photos that look old and they're just deteriorating and they're black and white? But you can see the power of God in them when you see them, right? Those old church services that you have pictures of and they're all wearing those funny clothes. That's so out style. I tell you, in 40 or 50 years, I want to look back on these pictures, and I want to say, what in the world were we wearing? <laughs> and why did I have my hair like that, right? Some of you old folks know what I'm talking about. I've seen your senior class picture. <laughs> it's just like, what were you thinking? It's a mullet. It's a party in the back and business in the front. Now, come on. That is, a mullet is not of God. <laughs> you can't be godly with a mullet. Anybody got a mullet here if you do? God loves you, and we got hair clippers in the back. <laughs> Either grow it long or grow it short. Just don't get stuck in between, because, yes. But what I'm getting at is I want to look back on these photos and see the move of God and say, we were crazy then, we're still crazy now, and the best is yet to come. It is. We started a church up in Vincenton, Jamaica, up in the mountains, an hour and a half drive from our condo that we were staying at. And uh, uh, there, there was just so many people that were flooding into that church, and God was moving. And, and it was another time where Linda said, look for rocks and look for the color yellow when you get there to that, that community. And I remember we pulled up, and that little church was up on a pile of rocks. I'm like, that's confirmation. And I thought, well, i got to look for yellow now, right? And I tell you what, here comes this little 89-year-old woman. Her name was Algie Gohagen. And she was dressed in yellow from her neck all the way down and a dress to her ankles and had a yellow hat on. We're at the right spot. And, and she said, I've been praying for 30 or 40 years for God to send you. 89 years old. And, you, and like Nate talked about, at 89 years old, a lot of people are, are in a different mindset. But you know what that little lady said, and she's passed since then. That was 10, 15 years ago. And she stood up to about here to me, and she looked up at me, and she said, Son, the best is yet to come. And I'll never forget that statement coming from that little 89-year-old woman. When we went back, she lived in the back of the church in just this little room with no running water, no electricity, nothing. And there spread out on her Bible were years' worth of notes after notes of what God had given her. Her old tattered Bible was laid open on that bed. She had been praying. She had been seeking God for uh, him to send us. And here we were. And she said, the best is yet to come. And I want you to know that today, church. This weekend is good but the best is still coming. Everything God has for you is in your future, not in your past. You need to claim that today. And what will happen to our future generations, what's going to happen to them if they don't see a fresh move of God in the church? Well, what's going to take place? I'm not talking about dry or stale religion. I long for a fresh anointing to fall, a new thing for God to do. I tell you what, it's been a very long time since we've had a wide-sweeping revival across this nation. Church, we need to be praying for that to happen now more than ever. By faith, I believe that it can take place. And I believe that we can be a part of it. If, if we'll die out to ourselves and we'll be revived. Like, like Brandon said, it's going to bubble out into this community. They're going to drive by and say, what in the world is going on out there? But it's been a while since we've had a nationwide revival. In fact, historians say America has had four great awakenings. And there's a little argument over the one that happened in the 70s, which was more of the Jesus movement, but four great awakenings. Can I tell you what? That's almost 50 years ago since our last great awakening in this nation. Church, we need to wake up. We've got a work to do. Well, Brad, we can't affect the whole nation. We're just here in central Illinois and in central Ohio. Oh, my goodness, my God can take a little shepherd boy and give him a little rock and stand him up against a nine-foot whatever giant and make him fall. God can use you. 
We used to sing a song that says, little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a cross, there's a crown, and you can win it if you will go in Jesus' name. Little as much, he can use us to affect the nation. I have faith to believe that. And I want to see that in our life. And we've wandered away from God over 50 years since our nation has been turned to Jesus in that big of a movement. Can I tell you, God didn't move. We said that earlier. God is constantly sending waves of revival. God's constantly sending his spirit. We just got to step into the water and catch the wave. We pray for revival, and I think God's confused because he's like, I sent revival. Revival. His name was Jesus. He died on the cross for your sin. I mean, it's there. There is revival. You just got to die out to yourself and get into it and find it for yourself. So stop praying for revival. Start praying for you to die out to yourself and get on board with what God's doing in this season of revival. Well, pastor, I'm praying for revival. It's already been established on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, my Bible says the same power that lives in that moment lives in us today. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is in you. There is power. I tell you what, I believe that America is ripe, and I'm not a theologian or a historian, but America is ripe for revival right now. We need it now more than ever. We need to invite God back into our schools. We need to invite God back into our church. We need to invite God back into our politics and our government. We need God. We need God. You need God. Let's personalize it. You need God back in our lives. I believe that I have the answer for every problem this nation's ever faced. I believe with 100% certainty that I have The answer for any question you have in your life is all right here. It's all right here. If I got a lot of questions, I got a lot of problems, I got a lot of situations, I I don't know what we're doing, I I don't know where the nation's at. I I watch CNN and Fox, turn that off, turn that off. I get on Facebook and I read through all these articles, turn that off, turn that off. I talk to the people down at the coffee, at the, at the local restaurant, change your topic. I talk to all my friends, my family, quit talking about what's going on in this nation and get back to this book. I tell you what, there was a, a lady here and she said, I, I had the news off for this week and she's like, I can't believe the peace that I've had. I mean, it was amazing. She was like, this, we should have done this a long time ago, a long time ago. I don't mind hearing the news, but I don't want all the opinions that come with the news. I'll form my own opinion based on this. I don't need to hear a panel of eight people on there discussing what's right and what's wrong. I'll go to the Bible that's the ultimate authority, the ultimate truth, and I'll stand on this book and this word and I'll not falter and I'll not apologize for it. That's the place that we have to get in this church. We've got to get bold for Jesus because the world is bold and the church needs to be bolder. The, Lord, the world is loud, the church needs to get louder. We've got to stand on the Word of God. We've got it all right there. We've walked away from the truth, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, that if my people who are called by my name, you know this, will humble themselves, read it with me, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. It's that easy. It's that easy. We've gotten into a mess as a nation. We need to humble ourselves first. We need to pray and seek the face that we've been talking about this weekend. We need to turn, repent from our wicked, evil ways. Quit making an excuse for your sin. Quit trying to justify your sin. Quit trying to make an excuse for your sin. 
Quit trying to compare your sin to another person's sin. This is between you and God, and there's going to come a great judgment day that you're going to stand before God by yourself and give an account for your life. Your mama or your daddy, your grandma or grandpa, aunt, uncle, your wife or your husband, your children, none of them will be with you in that moment. It's between you and God today. Get right with God. Oh my goodness, we've been talking about that, how so many people just want you to validate their sin. They just want you to okay their sin. I tell you what today, sin is not okay. No matter how you paint it. My grandpa used to say you can paint an old barn, but it's still an old barn. And you can sure come in here and have your church clothes on and look good and look pretty and say the right things, have a fish on your bumper sticker, wear WWJD. You can have everything that points people that you're a Christian, but on the inside, you're still dead. And if you're still dead, I don't care how many fishes you put on the back of your car, you ain't going to make heaven your home. And I tell you what, if you've got a fish on the back of your car, or you've got a WJD or something representing Jesus or something representing this church, I'm going to remind you today, you better be acting like a believer when you've got those things on. Because there's too many Christians out there doing the wrong things and pointing people the wrong direction, full of hate and judgment, full of nastiness going out and just being mad with their waitresses and their waiters and being nasty with the lack of help at Walmart. <laughs> and I tell you what, last night, and we all went to Steak and Shake, a bunch of us, and, and I love Shannon's heart. We, we got there and the guy said, we're going to be closing in 10 minutes. We're like, well, the Google said 2 a.m. He's like, well, that's the drive through but inside we're closing in 10 minutes. Hint, hint, hint. Well, we're going to stay and eat. We're hungry. And so we did. And I love Shannon's heart. She said, hey, why don't we all take up a collection and bless the staff here? Amen. And, and we did. What did we come up with? And, and I didn't have any cash. I felt really bad. But they all came up with some cash. <laughs> Hey, li listen, don't get all dry teeth and pious. Because your other pastor, Brandon, didn't have any cash either. <laughs> See? There's benefits to carrying plastic. We came up with $100. They came up with $100. <laughs> and guess what the uh, manager's name was? Brandon. And they blessed him, and boy, everything just changed. The atmosphere changed. Because you bless somebody, they want to be a blessing. You pour into somebody, they want to pour back out into somebody else. It's contagious. And if you're representing Jesus and you're wearing all these shirts and all of this stuff on your car, you better go in with love. You better go in with grace. You better go in with mercy into these places. Because Jesus did the same thing. He drew all men unto him, and I'm thankful for that. We're living in an age where people say right is wrong and wrong is right. We talked about how people try to justify what they're going through. Look at what the Bible says about that in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is wrong. You can call me old-fashioned this morning, but I believe that if the Bible says it's right, it's right. I believe that if the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. And I'll stand on that. And I won't apologize for that. In love. In love, that's the key. See, so many times we stand on scriptures and we just get hateful and downright mean. And I grew up around a bunch of those people that were just hateful and downright mean. They were part of an admiration society where they just said, oh, we're all so good. Let's, let's just hover together. We're doing the right things. Can I tell you what? You need to go out into the world with the right things, but with the right spirit and the right attitude as well. And you need to be full of love. They will know we are Christians by our love. You see, America is either going to experience revival or America is going to experience the divine judgment of God in this last day and hour. And I believe that if you're a born-again believer, there's a simple solution to stir up revival, and it's found there in 2 Chronicles. Humble yourself first. Some of you all need to humble yourself. You're full of pride. You think you can do it all on your own. You think you've accomplished a lot in your life. You think you've arrived. You need to humble yourself today 
And this is for me too, church. I don't preach anything that I haven't dealt with in my heart first. And I came to a place even this weekend that I had to humble myself in a few areas. Then you pray and seek his face. That's the recipe. And then you turn from your sin. That's when true revival and healing will break out in your heart. It's that simple. We need to get sick and tired. What? We need to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Church, we need to get sick and tired of sick and tired. (laughs) I'm sick and tired of dead, dry church. I'm sick and tired of religion. I'm sick and tired of that sin that I keep struggling with. I'm sick and tired of that addiction. I'm sick and tired of unhealthy marriages. I'm sick and tired of lukewarmness. I'm sick and tired of the church being asleep. I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired. We need revived and restored and woke up this morning. I want my children to be raised in the spirit of revival. I want them to see mom and dad so full of Jesus that they won't ever walk away from it because there's power and there's authority in Jesus today. I want to look back and remember this tent revival, the boldness, the holiness, uh, everything about it. And I want to remember the history of victory that God has given us here. There's a history of victory in your life and you walk into that. I want my family to be around the fire. I, I want to have the church around the fire. I want our community to see the fire. I just want to be burning for Jesus so bright that people will come out and watch us burn. You know, a good time, well, not a good time, but listen here. I better watch my words. But when there's a fire at a house or a barn or going on in the community, Guess what? A bunch of rubberneckers come out. That's what we used to call them. And the fire department loves these rubberneckers because they get right in their way. But when something's on fire, people come out and watch it burn. It's the most awkward thing. We stand out there and just watch somebody's life just burn away. We take pictures. Oh, this is so cool. Can I tell you what? I want Family Worship Center to catch on fire so much that people drive out here just to watch us burn. I want the community to say, you know that church is burning out there, it's on fire, it's actually a little crazy, it's getting a little wild. Did you see all those pictures on Facebook? It looked like a lot of weird things were going on. Let's just go out there and be nosy. Let's go out there. We've had other people from other churches come in. We're, We're just here to try to see what you guys are doing. I don't know what we're doing. I don't have a, I don't have a plan. I'm your pastor. I'm just, I don't have a three-step program to grow the church. I didn't go to a conference last week on how to get the lights better and the smoke to come out a little bit more to, to induce the Holy Spirit into the crowd. I, I, didn't, I didn't go to cemetery, seminary. <laughs> now listen, I, <laughs> you hear my heart. I'm not knocking seminary. I'm not. I I love that people can go and learn about Jesus and get indoctrinated. (laughs) I always tell people I grew up in seminary. If you'd have known my mom and dad, and you all did, I was in seminary all of my life. My grandma had me enrolled in seminary whenever I was just a little baby. I sat on that church pew. We didn't have kids' church like y'all have kids' church. We had Sunday school before church, and then we had to go sit in church. And we had to behave, and we had to be good, and we had to sit there prim and proper. And I remember if I'd move or squirm or do anything, my dad's hand, no matter where I was in the sanctuary, would find my head and go, whop! (laughs) All right, I'm paying attention. Jesus, Jesus, I'm, I'm just praying, Dad. We were in a church where the pastor would call you out and say, Brad, quit fidgeting and playing with that pencil. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I grew up in seminary. I was there Sunday night, Sunday evening. I was there Wednesday night. Sometimes we had Bible school on Friday night, and then sometimes the pastor would say, we're having a party on Saturday. I'll go back to church. I was there. We prayed so long, my knees are still damaged <laughs> from praying on that old concrete floor with just a little bit of carpet over it. I grew up in seminary. The Word of God was instilled in me at a young age. 
And it's blessed me throughout my life. And it's sustained me. Can I tell you what, mom and dads, you need to be pouring the Bible into your children. Don't be expecting us to do it. We can add to it. We can be a bonus for your kids. But you need to be putting God and the fear of God into your kids. We were at Bible study at the men's group this week. And and somebody was talking about their children and if they're required to come to church, if they still live at home. And, and, uh, you know, there was a various discussion, not right or wrong. But I said, I might be a little old school, but if they're still living in my house, they're required to be in God's house. I ain't going to force it on them. I ain't going to shove the Bible down their throat. But it's important, Mom and Dad, that your kids are around the church and the things of God. And that you're not just having an hour a week, but you're having a devotional time at home. You're praying for your meals. Well, Brad, I'm going to be at Cracker Barrel. People might see me pray. They might think we're weird. They already think you're weird. I mean, have you looked in the mirror? They are, you're already weird. Just be weirder. Next time, stand and ask the waitress to join you. Join hands. <laughs> Father God, we pray for this meal. We pray the calories out of these biscuits. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Quit being ashamed of the gospel. Quit being ashamed of the things of God, church. I want Family Worship Center to be different and bold. Not weird and crazy, like picketing things. You know, some of those Christian, God hates this person. I'm all this out here and just look stupid. No. That's not what God wants. He wants you to be an example everywhere you go. Even at Walmart. When there's only one lane open. (laughs) And then they have all these self-checkouts. And you've got to do all the work yourself. (laughs) And you leave, and you're like, I didn't even get paid for that. (laughs) Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Don't stand in that line. Oh, this is crazy. I ain't got time for this. We're going to hurry it up. Have you ever seen anything this dumb and stupid? Well, we got one light over there, and then we got all these cell chats. You ain't looking like Jesus doing that. Well, I, uh, I had a problem at a local establishment. I need to get to my, uh, my cell phone and my computer so I can put a Facebook post and a review. <laughs> Love like Jesus, forgive them. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know why I'm getting into all that. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at. But all I know is I want the power and presence of God in this church, in this life, in my life, in my family. And I want it to continue for generations to come where they say grandma and grandpa, great grandpa. Oh my goodness, I tell you what, I want them to say, you know, almost 11 years ago we've had this church started. It's only almost 11, November will be 11 years that Family Worship Center has been in existence. Look what God's done in just 11 years. Two campuses, glory to God, two campuses. Just the move of God, the power of God, the influence of God. But I tell you what, I want people to one day look back on this church and say there was a power then, and there's still a power now. There's still power in that church. I, I tell you what, if we ever get away from the Bible, or if I ever preach, or Brandon ever preaches something that's not of the Bible, you come and find us and let's talk. Because it's what we're building this church on. We're building the church on the things of Jesus Christ. The house of God's not a social club. We need to wake up. It's not just a, a time to sit here on Sunday and check our box and then go live like the devil the rest of the week. It's not an admiration society. It's not about the way that mom and dad did church. It's not about tradition. It's not about numbers. It's not about money. It's not about the light show. It's not about the programs. It's not about this class. It's not about this person. It's not about this thing. It's not about the parking lot. It's not about the carpet. It's not about the lights or if the ceiling fans are on or off or if it's hot or cold in here. It's not about that today. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. But then it's about you. What are you doing with the gospel? What are you taking out of here 
into your life and your family, your world, your community. We need to pray God send revival to our community for generations to come that go beyond this tent revival. Psalm 80, verse 3, restore us, revive us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Revival is not old-fashioned. It's not just a thing of the past. Can I tell you what? Quit living a defeated lifestyle. Jesus defeated the sin for you years ago. Why are you walking around defeated? There's victory, there's grace, there's mercy, there's love, there's long-suffering, there's patience, there's goodness, there's all kinds of things that God wants for you, but you've got your heart so crowded with other things that there's no room for God. Clear your heart this morning. And I want to encourage somebody that feels defeated, depressed, downtrodden. Maybe you're here this morning, and like we talked about last night, you're thinking about giving it all up. You're just tired. You're exhausted. Can I remind you that we're on the winning team? We're on the winning side. We used to sing an old song that says, Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope, no joy within. And my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. And now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. I am on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for cause of truth and right. Well, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. From the straight and narrow way, I was drifting every day. Out upon the waters deep and wide, but it's all over now. Glory light is on my brow, and my soul is on the winning side. Come on now. I will never have a fear, for my Lord is ever near, and in Him so often I confide. Listen, He's the keeper of my soul, since I died to myself and gave Him control. And he placed me on the winning side. I'm going to do that verse again. That was good. (laughs) Come on. Some of y'all just sitting there like a bunch of pious gas bags. Let's get up. Come on. We're singing about being on the winning team, the winning side. I'm tired of defeated. I'm tired of tired. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being lazy. I'm tired of being lukewarm. We are a team on the winning side. I'm tired of the church being on the defense. It's time to get on the offense and storm the gates of hell and take back what Satan stole from us. Oh, we just sit and complain. We sit and say, that's the way it always is. We sit and say, can you believe what they're doing? We sit and say, not in my house. We sit and say, not in my school. But then we just sit. We're defensive. Let's get offensive. Let's go take back what Satan stole from us. I got to calm down. 
I got to get my breath. I will never have a fear for my Lord is ever near and in him so often I confide. I can hear my grandma sing this. He's the keeper of my soul since I gave him full control. And he plays me on the winning side. Abby and Chantel, come up here. Come here. Come up here. I grew up with these people in the church I was raised in. Special people to me. Special. Marty, God bless you. You don't sing or I'd brought you up here too, brother. Special people from my childhood. And I want to sing this course. You all know this course, don't you? Let's sing it for Jesus. You ready? I am on the winning side. I am on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. I'm going to do it again. You ready? I am on the winning side. I am on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. We're going to keep singing it until you get it. I am on the winning side. I am on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Yes, you're on the winning team. Thank you. You're on the winning team. Stay standing. We're going to have an altar call. Oh, glory to God. You're not a loser. You're not ugly. You're not overweight and fat and nobody wants you no more. You're not who you used to be. You're not a drug addict. You're not an alcoholic. You're not a nobody. God's made you a somebody because he sent somebody to die for your sin. You are a child of God. You're a chosen generation. You're different now than you used to be. The old is gone and the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're an heir to the righteousness of his throne. You are a kingdom shaker. You are a part of the church. It's not this building. You are the church. Oh, we got a little old school to say. We got a little old-fashioned. But why change it if it works? It worked back then. It works today because it's the power of God. And as they do an altar call, I didn't even finish my sermon, but I don't care. It's time to stop. And the Holy Spirit says, this is it. It's it. It's it.
as your pastor and Brandon as your pastor I've talked to him I know his heart too our heart is that something happened this weekend that will forever change you I was ordained in 2009 I'm going to be honest with you after COVID hit it was hard on me as a pastor my heart broke for the people they were scattered they were divided they were confused they were scared and I've been discouraged as your pastor trying to lead what God's doing here especially whenever you don't really see people following and stepping into what God's wanting to do because there's so much more for you church that you're not tapping into and I'm not saying everybody but you know who you are there's so much more than just living the way you're living defeated and tired exhausted depressed anxious afraid sinful looking just like the world and saying I'm a Christian you need to be different and there's a difference that happens now in this church Brandon, you and I are drawing a line. We're drawing a bloodline. Come here, brother. We're drawing a line around the people of God here at Family Worship Center. Satan, you cannot touch this church. Satan, you cannot have these people anymore. Satan, you're not going to keep them confused any longer. Satan, you're not going to keep them in their sin anymore. Satan, you're not going to keep them defeated anymore. Satan, you're not going to keep them broken anymore. Satan, you're not going to keep them addicted anymore. Satan, you're not going to let them get that divorce. Satan, you're not going to break up their friendships and unity that they need in their life. Satan, you're not going to let them keep living in their sin. Satan, you're not going to break apart their family and their home. Satan, you're not going to destroy their children. You're going to bring them back like a prodigal son. Satan, you are defeated. Satan, we're on the winning team. We're on the winning side. We're different. We're different after this week. We're moving. We're moving. Are you with us? Are you with us today? Are you ready? Are you ready? I know it's different. I know we've never done anything like this. But I'm tired of doing church the way that we've always done church. And if that's what you want, it's not here anymore. We're different. I see a fire in Brandon this week that I've never seen before. Listen, I see a fire in you that I've never seen before. Are you going to keep fanning that flame? Or are you going to let it burn out? We're a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We're different. Open your hearts today, church. Break down that wall. Some of you here are hurt from a past church, and you're like, I just don't know if I believe all this. Some of you are hurt by a pastor. Sorry. I've been hurt by a pastor in real ways. I get it. But it's not about a man. It's not about a woman. It's about Jesus. It's about the Father, and it's about the Holy Spirit. People will fail you and let you down. Some of you have been abused, neglected, orphaned, and just mistreated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It shouldn't have happened. It wasn't right. I'm sorry. Some of you all been in the drug house, the whore house. You've just been in all these houses that you shouldn't have been in, doing things that you're not proud of. I'm sorry. But it's over now. No more. It's the past. God's got a future. 
Some of you are here today and your marriage is about ready to break up. You're about ready to give up in your marriage. You're about ready to throw in the towel. That's what the devil wants. There's healing here. And you get it. And then watch what your spouse gets. We had someone last night say they were considering taking their life. My heart broke. And if that's you today, it's time to move. You're on the winning side. And if you're not, I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you. Diagnosed with cancer in 2018, I knew I was on the winning side. I had a moment where I struggled and with my wife, we cried so many tears. But at the end of the day, I knew I was on the winning side. I knew that if I died, I was going to make heaven my home. And I'd just been up there waiting for you all to hurry up and get up there. Then I was diagnosed with lung cancer, just 20, 21, the beginning. My like, God, what are you doing? Four different doctors, one from Barnes, one from Washington, one from Springfield, and one from, uh, one from uh, Mattoon here. They all said, you got lung cancer. Right. And in fact, one doctor... I'll never forget, I was sitting in the recliner, my wife was on the couch, we were doing a conference call. And I said, Doc, with this kind of cancer, what do you think we're looking at? He said, it's fine, I, I think you got a good 10 years. 10 years, I'm 37, I won't get to see my kids graduate or get married. What do you mean 10 years? But God. went down there to Barnes. You all were part of this journey. You guys surrounded me with such love and prayers, and it was your prayers that delivered me. See, we're on the winning side. I went down there with no fear. I just said, take this out, whatever it is, get rid of it. Like Nate talked about, cut it out. I remember that doctor came in that night. I was still a little drugged up, but he came in after he'd done the procedure, and he said, I don't know what's in you. I've never seen anything like it before. What do you mean? Is that bad or good? And he's like, I am tired. I got to go home and sleep. We'll talk in the morning. Man, I wrestled with God all that night. What do you mean? He's never seen anything like it before. I thought it was bad. Like, he's like, there's, I don't know what it is. The next morning he came in and he said, hey, the results are back. And that tumor, he's like, for some reason, it's a fungus. There was a fungus among us. And in that moment, I became a very fun guy. I was like, woo! <laughs> because my God had delivered me. I said, how did I get this fungus? He said, working in the dirt. I'm like, okay, what do I do about it? Nothing, it'll take care of itself. Okay? And here I stand. Why? Because I'm on the winning side. How was I able to overcome? How was I able to get through it? How was I able to keep my faith? Because I knew I was on the winning team. And you're part of that winning team if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Are you ready for revival in your heart? You've seen it at the tent meeting. Are you wanting that? It's there. It's free. It's available. All right. I'm done. Brittany, take it away. And here's your job. Move. Move.